I want to thank everybody for joining me today and for the opportunity to speak to you. I especially want to thank Lucy. If I have anything to say of value, Lucy has my wildlife native plant book for sale in, his wild, in her wild bird store, and I wish you would support her and buy it from there instead of Amazon. Anyhow, I, I've I bought doing... mine years ago. I'm not sure where where I got mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out for quite a while, Marion. I appreciate you purchasing a copy. But um, I've been doing this talk in one form or another. Some of you have probably been hearing me. Oh, my God. Some of your folks that were on there early have been, Gail, for example, have been hearing me probably for close to 30 years. But um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And um, I'll be happy to take questions when I'm done, and I'm going to run through this. You know, Dr. Tallamy, who was mentioned previously in the uh, list of 10 best plants and the fact that oaks are the best, and that's been repeated over and over again, has done an awful lot to wake people up to the importance of native plants, landscapes, and how wildlife interact with them, butterflies, birds, etc., insects in general. But I'm going to start out by simply saying there is no list of 10 best plants. So I am going to go on with this and uh, do what I do. I, I was critiqued once a long time ago when I was with the University of Florida uh, for a seminar I gave there where I said this, but it's certainly true. You know, if you want to attract wildlife to your landscape, um, it doesn't really matter if you're in the woods or in your yard, it's the same thing. They need habitat, habitat being food, water, and cover. And if you can provide that and the wildlife is within reach of your property, you will be able to provide habitat for them. And I get really dismayed at these so-called backyard uh, habitats, like we need to just hide it from the rest of the world in our backyard. And um, I get really tired of programs that talk about attracting wildlife because that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about providing habitat so wildlife can actually live in the areas that we live and work in and are able to raise young and continue moving forward because we live in the scariest and most interesting times that humans have ever been on this planet. And we're seeing a huge loss of all kinds of wildlife from butterflies and pollinators to birds, et cetera, documented worldwide in most every place, especially where we have developed landscapes, a huge crash in the numbers, not just species, but numbers of things. And so what we do in our yard is absolutely critical. It is a vital component to this overall conservation message that I know all of your members buy into. Development is altered landscape. It's certainly true. You know, when we build something in Florida, which we're constantly doing, I don't think you can hardly drive down a road that still has a vacant lot and not see it bulldozed sometime in the near future if it's not being bulldozed right now. And when they do that, they clear everything off. I used to be a environmental consultant for a short period of time, and a developer doesn't want to mess with saving trees and plants. It's so much easier to bulldoze it flat put the house up without anything getting in the way and then plant something. And of course, what they plant nine times out of 10 are not native species, certainly never designed to attract or provide wildlife habitat, things that grow fast, things that are colorful, et cetera, et cetera. We have lost a huge number and diversity of native plants in developed landscapes and that is strictly in our hands to rectify. I've shown this picture for 30 plus years. It was a 35 color, uh, millimeter color slide. And someday the gentleman's going to walk in on my talk. I hope he's not watching tonight. You know that when he drives into that garage, he's not looking to see what amazing creatures are in his landscape today, right? Because you know there's nothing there. If there was something there, he would hate it. And I always say he because I don't believe a woman would ever do this to her house. But I don't understand foundation plantings. Why do we plant things that are foundation? Why do we think that normal is grass and there is nothing to be seen? I mean, the places I live in, you know, and hummingbirds are migrating because they don't nest where I've lived, at least since I've moved to Florida to any real extent. You know, during migration, when hummingbirds are around, I am looking the entire time I'm driving into my driveway to see if hummingbirds are on my firebush out front or my coral honeysuckle or my red salvia and I'm looking to see what kind of birds are in my yard and I'm 
monitoring the butterflies and the caterpillars and the plants in my front gardens and not just my back gardens. And that gives me excitement, you know? It gives me a reason to want to come home. It's not that I hate work, but I think the anticipation, the joy of landscapes are things that we've lost because we design landscapes that look like this, that provide absolutely no habitat. And we share our property with absolutely nothing. When we do that, this is an Apalachicola National Forest. And for the life of me, I don't understand why we don't design yards that look like this. You know, I'm not advocating that we plunk a house in the middle of Apalachicola, but when we look at this diverse understory that is mostly grass, it's just not mowed to an inch of its life. It's full of flowers. It's full of wildlife. It's full of living beings. Why don't we opt for this more often than we not? Because this is certainly not typical. Urban development has impacted a huge part of Florida. We are faced with such a challenging task if we're going to try to reverse this. And I throw this out, and this is old. But if you just look at four counties, that is a huge part of Florida that's completely gone. And we have the most aggressive land acquisition program in the nation, at least we did before we got the recent governors in board. About 25% of Florida has been set aside. So it's not so much that Florida has no conservation lands. We have uh, state programs. We have federal programs. We have some of those beautiful state and federal national forests and state parks. We have county programs like in Hillsborough and Pinellas and Polk, et cetera. It's all over the place. We have all kinds of programs to purchase things. But frankly, we are really at a loss to have money set aside for management because we can't just let these things sit there and go without management with all of the issues faced with exotic pest plants and animals, the lack of fire and all the other things that need to be done. When the state looks at the value of this, for the life of me, I don't understand why they've underfunded this Florida Forever program for as long as they have. People come to Florida for wildlife. You know, so much of our tourist industry is based on having clean oceans and clean beaches, but also on all of the wildlife you can see. Audubon folks know about this. You're showing pictures of all those great birds, you know. People come here from all over the world to see great birds. And that brings in a huge amount of money. And that interest in bird watching amongst other things and butterfly watching which is gaining so much attention in the last decade perhaps it comes from people out of state it comes from people that live here it's over three billion in total sales a year it's huge so we have this economic incentive to set aside create and manage wildlife but we also have this huge population of people that theoretically care about wildlife I wouldn't be doing this for 30 plus years like I have if I didn't believe that the average person still finds joy in butterflies, finds joy in hummingbirds. When they see an amazing songbird, especially during migration, God, when the red stars would come through my yard, I'd be just so excited. If there's a painted bunning, which is rare for me, it's the most glorious day in the universe. You know, people want that, but they don't understand that they're something they can actually do to encourage it it's not just this passive thing like somebody's going to provide it for me or it's just going to show up on its own it really is about us understanding what we need to do to create a landscape that is what i call a living landscape you know i've been writing about my new yard uh for a couple of years now on a blog that i call uh we're no fences one word dot blog spot if anyone's interested and it comes from the fact that when I was a kid, there just weren't fences, you know? I would wander all the neighborhoods. All the neighbors would come out when I was wandering around their yard and encourage me to pick a few flowers or look for caterpillars and all the rest of that stuff. We're not living in that age anymore. But we still have the capacity to create it in our own yard for our kids, our grandkids, and ourselves. But we're losing species. It's crazy. The number of vertebrate wildlife, the number of invertebrate wildlife that are in decline in Florida, given the fact that we have this public interest, we have 
a fairly aggressive land acquisition program until relatively recently. And all these declines in wildlife are correlated to loss of plant species. This is a part from Zixia, about the coolest wildflower in the universe. Anyhow, we have more native plants in this state than any state in the union except Texas and California. If you think about it, you understand how absolutely diverse Texas and California are to Florida where we're mostly flat and there isn't a lot of relief. We've got the semi-tropics and we've got the Alabama, Georgia part of Florida, but it's nothing like California or Texas that have vast deserts and ocean fronts and all the mountains, et cetera, et cetera, that they've got. We have this absolutely incredible diversity of native plants. People come down here from other states, think they need to amend the soil and do something about it. That's just absolutely ridiculous because these 28 hundred species of native plants live in Florida without anyone adding potting soil to the hole when they're planted. We have this unbelievable ability and diversity at our fingertips to work with, and a lot of them are declining. And I'm not saying that, you know, I know I have friends that kind of have this Noah's Ark approach to landscaping. It's like they want to save two of everything in their yard, and that's not the approach we're talking about. We're talking about creating habitat. But our conservation efforts at providing habitat can ensure the perpetuation of species of plants that are in decline, as well as creating habitat for wildlife that needs our help. And so that was my old house. That's not what my entire yard looked like, but a little tiny corner out by the road. It's a jungle. It doesn't have to be. Parts of my yard certainly weren't. Parts of my yard were sunny. Parts of my yard were forested and shady. Wildlife move from one place to another, depending on what species and what their preference were. But the real challenge for us is to make this a personal quest. What is it that we're trying to provide habitat for? What do we need to do to do that? And what are the species that are available to us? You know, in 30 plus years, I'm proud to say I've never made a list of what the 10 best anythings are because I don't believe in them. You know, I think that the greatest value any landscape is diversity. And the second thing we have to consider is our context and what we're trying to accomplish. You know, live oaks are good trees for certain things. Almost nothing nests in them. If you're a bird watcher, you're probably unlikely to find a lot of bird nests in a live oak tree. It's not designed well for that. It does oak trees in general feed a lot of moths and a few butterflies and they create caterpillars, but so do many dozens of other plants. But I have live oaks in my neighbor's yard. There is no reason for me to tie up my yard, half of it maybe with shade from a live oak when they're already next door to me. It's the same with the red cedars that I don't need to plant. I have a sweet gum behind me. I have uh, cherry laurels behind me. I don't have to add those. I don't need to add a maple tree. I don't need to add a bunch of things because they're in my neighborhood. What I need to do is look at what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What isn't here? What are the characteristics of the plants that I most want? And can I add them to my yard? What will it do? And that doesn't take a PhD in wildlife biology. It takes a little bit of research time that most people don't take to do a little bit of research on what plants are really available to them and which ones do I want to grow. And when we do that, we create a landscape with an ecological purpose. We're not restoring habitat. I run into a lot of issues over the years, and that's cool. I don't mind being controversial. Um, from people that say, well, you're planting things that aren't really native because they don't grow within your habitat type or within 50 miles of your yard. And I say, great, I'm proud of that. Um, because growing zones are meaningless. Habitat conditions are what matters and creating diversity with plants adapted to your site is really where it's at. And I have a lot of diversity here. And as I monitor the changes in my yard, because I moved into a absolutely typical suburban neighborhood desert where half my neighbors have rock yards and no plants, half my neighbors just have really crappy grass and a couple of hedge plants that aren't native up by their front door. And if birds and other wildlife are going to use my yard, they're going to have to, it's about the only thing they've got available. I'm really interested to see how that changes. And those changes have been dramatic in the few years since I've started. 
So we need to look at habitat and not what's pretty, not what's aesthetic, not in restoration, but in terms of creating the most diverse living landscape we can do with the amount of space we got and the conditions we inherit. And it's gotta be about Florida. And this problem is huge. And the use of non-natives in Florida is overwhelming. When I go to garden clubs and I use this slide, I get oohs and ahs from everybody going, oh my God, that's gorgeous. And I look at this and I go, that is the most disgusting planting I've ever seen in my life. I mean, there is no living thing really. In it. it is true that some of those plants do provide some nectar for bees, but you know, most plants or most animals from insects up to birds and mammals are not starving to death. We think so much in terms of food and we think so little in terms of habitat. And bees need places to live, not just nectar and almost any flower works. That's really not so much the issue with pollinator gardens, which has gotten so much attention lately. It's not lack of food, it's habitat loss. This is a devil's mill hopper. God, someday they're gonna reopen it because it's closed for COVID right now. It's really discouraged. I drove up there for three hours from my home and had to drive home. So habitat is food, water, and cover. It needs all three things. It's not about caterpillars, although caterpillars are really a good thing. The bottom line on caterpillars, though, just don't use pesticides. My God, because invertebrates are what birds mostly feed their young and so many other wildlife species do. And it's not so much about the oak tree or the other nine trees on that list as it is about not killing them with pesticides. It has to be done for the wildlife we're trying to attract. The picture on the left and, oh, and the right are both from Christina Evans. I'm sure some of you know her. She's a great friend of mine and did most of the decent wildlife pictures in all of my books. And, you know, these are in her backyard. I mean, why don't we go bird watching in my backyard? I used to go bird watching in my old house that was really well done for wildlife and mature enough to attract things. And I did almost all my bird watching in my backyard. I could have an adult beverage. I could sit on the back porch. I could put my feet up and relax and watch birds with my binoculars. And it was so much easier than getting in a car and driving somewhere and go bird watching. And I had, I, you know, that one spring I had every bunting, every tanager, every uh, close to 30 species of warblers. I had so many things in my yard during that three or four week period because it was designed to provide for those. Migrating birds like this red start are going to be there for the insects in the spring and some water feature, especially a flowing water feature, something that moves. And they would, and all the warblers would line up and pick out insects from the live oak. It was a great plant for that, but they aren't nesting there. So they would move on and that live oak was basically dead the rest of the year. Very few things used it, but it was critical during migration. If what we're doing is trying to attract the most migrants, then we look at those kinds of things. If we're looking to attract resident birds to nest and, and uh, live year round in our yard, then we got to provide cardinal habitat. And that's a much different thing. You know, the difference between a gray squirrel and a fox squirrel is, is absolutely huge. I bet none of you don't have gray squirrels in your yard. I'll give you some if you want. You know, they come and just mess up my little wildflower nursery, digging the dirt up and bearing China berry fruit. And I feed them anyhow, but not with a feeder. I let stuff fall on the ground and I feel sorry for them. And a fox squirrel, I would give anything to have a fox squirrel in my yard, but they are a threatened species in this part of the world and very uncommon because they have different habitat needs. It doesn't mean we couldn't have fox squirrels in our yard if we designed habitat for it. But the types of landscape designs and the plants we typically choose favor gray squirrels like crazy and blue jays and a few other things that are really common. They're co and mockingbirds common because they love what we've done to this state. We also need to understand that habitat changes uh, by season. You know, this yellow rump warbler that I still want to call a myrtle warbler, I'm sorry, but they eat myrtle wax myrtle fruit in the winter, and that's why they were in my yard. If you have wax myrtles and you need boys and girls, but mostly girls, most men are superfluous, just need a few of us in the world. When you have wax myrtle fruit, you're going to get tree swallows and you're going to get yellow rump warblers, and they're going to be here in the winter. And they're not eating bugs like they 
do in Dr. Tallamy's part of the world when they're breathing up north. Bluebirds, you know, I've watched bluebirds um, at, um, I believe it was, yeah, it was at Olino State Park near Gainesville once, and there was a lot of uh, flowering dogwoods and fruit. And there were at least 11 bluebirds in those dogwoods eating the fruit like crazy that day. So many birds switch to a fruit-based diet when insects are hard to come by in the colder months. So we need to focus on the whole picture, the time of year and what we're trying to attract. It's not enough just to focus on food. And of course, if we're gonna develop pollinator gardens and if we're looking for butterfly gardens like a lot of people do, we need to have the host plant. It does us no good to put wildflowers or other kinds of flowering plants out and think we're doing something because we're not. If we're not creating habitat for them to lay eggs and have caterpillars. And all butterflies are such species specialists that we can kind of pick what butterflies we want in our yard that are in our region and design the ability for them to actually live with us. And then the second most important thing is then we're feeding birds with caterpillars, not necessarily oak trees. Because if this little guy is laying eggs, this is a palmetto skipper. If I'm not, it might be a Delaware. I get them mixed up sometimes. Somebody knows Gail or someone else chime in. It's, it's one of those butterflies when it lays eggs, it's got all these caterpillars. Most of them in nature are supposed to get eaten. So many butterfly gardeners I know bring all the caterpillars they find in side and put them in a cage and feed them till they hatch out because oh heaven forbid one of them might get eaten. The whole idea of a living landscape is to provide that balance and a butterfly garden well designed with host plants is going to provide food for birds just as well as so many other things. So we need to understand these kinds of things. I talked about bluebirds. You know this Florida talent butterfly was thought to be extinct when I first came to Florida, at least extirpated from Florida. I got a really excited phone call about a year into my tenure. You know, I wrote a butterfly gardening book many years ago, and it's completely superfluous now with the really good books that have come out since. But I got a call from a butterfly person down in South Florida, down around Broward County, and they telling me I had to come down because they just rediscovered a towel of butterflies during a median in a metropolitan part of, I think it was in Fort Lauderdale eating kuti plants and I took this picture and a bunch of other ones it was so exciting to know they were still there and all it took was to plant kuntis back in the world because we had ripped them out of every South Florida habitat and planted it with garbage instead of native species and we started adding kuntis again to the landscape and discovered they made a decent landscape plant this butterflies come back like gangbusters it's so exciting to get birds like this in your yard. I'm sorry. I just have to leave that in there because I love that picture that Christina took and I love that bird. This is the way my book cover should look, but they turned it sideways so it would fit better on the cover. But you know, food is such a mixed bag of what it is because almost all birds, and we'll talk mostly about birds today, eat fruit and eat insects and eat uh, seeds, they eat a whole variety of things. Sometimes it balance changes by time of year, but it's not just caterpillars. Although I've been picking on it, providing caterpillars and other invertebrates is absolutely critical for most nestling birds. We can't plant a suet feeder. So some kinds of food we can augment. And I, you know, I, I spent about 25 years downplaying feeders and making fun of them. So I'll come clean with you guys. And I put up bird feeders about a year and a half ago and I have a blast with them. It's as much for me as it is for anybody, let's be honest. But when I can supply food that's not available in my plantings, and my plantings are too young to be providing a lot of the things they will someday especially a lot of the fruit. A lot of my plants aren't really flowering heavy or making fruit yet. My feeders can supplement that. They can supplement uh, spring migration of hummingbirds if you don't have the right plants and flower at that time, et cetera. And the landscape approach that I've been pushing, not feeders so much, puts this burden on providing food. It provide, it's something we need to do. And so that gives us this freedom that we should embrace, that we can actually do something. 
I'm not tied down to putting in pittus forums and legustrums. I can be creative. I can use my mind and my creative side and I can decide what it is I want to do. And if I do it right, I will have the kinds of results I look for. Plants can provide lots of food. And I, I've had this kind of set of slides now for ages and ages, and I'll use them one more time. This is a flowering dogwood. There is not a person in the world, if you put a flowering dogwood in your yard, would, would condemn you for creating a wildlife habitat. Oh my God, what will my neighbors think? Because this is a great wildlife plant. It just happens to also be beautiful. We aren't necessarily giving up beauty by using native plants. But what we need to do is select plants not for their aesthetics first and foremost, but for what they do when they're in the environment. And so plants can provide food in a lot of ways directly. And one is with soft fruit. A lot of birds and a lot of other animals eat soft fruit. This is a valuable source. Plants also provide seeds. A lot of migratory birds will come in and eat grass seeds, not St. Augustine grass, but some of the native grasses like Fakahatchee grass that have a relatively big size, maybe even muley grass to some limited extent. Other plants, this is a Florida elm. You know, Florida elms are so good for feeding birds because they produce these seeds early in the spring. Almost nothing else does. That awful Chinese elm, which they also call Drake elm, fruits in the fall. There is no shortage of food in the fall. And why would anybody eat this dry, tasteless seed if there were better things to eat? But in the spring, this is, can be really critical. We understand the seeds. We understand that plants can provide nuts. This is a black walnut, which is a fairly rare plant in Florida. I wouldn't recommend me planting here. And you know, if you plant nuts, you're going to get squirrels. You probably also know, as your Audubon people, that birds have not had teeth since Archaeopteryx went extinct. So it's been a long time before, since a bird's been able to chew something up with his teeth and rip it up with his claws. These things are squirrel food. And so when we plant hickories and we plant uh, walnuts and we plant a whole bunch of other and acorns, to be honest, for a lot of them are primarily going to feed squirrels unless you have turkeys. And the last, the thing I want to talk about that I'll hit on again is we talk about fruit and seeds and nuts. It also depends somewhat on the size of this thing. Because under that big husk, that black walnut is still a really large nut. There is not a bird that I know of in North America big enough to swallow a black walnut. Some of them could swallow a hickory, but they're not going to digest it. Those are designed to be chewed up. But some fruit is just too big for small birds. And so the size of the fruit can be really important. Plants can provide food through nectar. This is a pickerel weed with a couple of um, skipper butterflies on it. I think those are palmetto skippers, but again, I could be wrong. Um, not everything, you know, it's not just butterflies and bees, but we do understand this huge increase in pollinator garden interest, oftentimes misplaced, but at least the interest is there and something we, I can build on and hopefully we all can build on. But even birds sometimes go for nectar. You know, I watched cardinals one day in my coral honeysuckle, just like when I was a little kid and I'd, I'd get red clover and I'd pull out each little clover thing and suck the... Uh, nectar out of it. Maybe some of you did that too, but that's what this cardinal was doing all morning long, picking off a flower, chewing on the bottom of it to get all the nectar out, spitting the flower out, taking another one. It pretty much denuded my entire coral honeysuckle, but it was cool. Nectar can be important and it's not just for butterflies and bees. And we can provide foliage if we really want to feed deer. Almost nobody does. We want to feed gopher tortoises and plants are not all the same, so we can design things that rabbits, deer, gover, tortoises, other foliage feeding herbivores are going to benefit from if that's what we want to provide for. But plants also provide food indirectly by how they exist. And of course, this um, is another Christina Evans picture taken in her yard with her fake water feature. And what a great picture. I love this thing. I think I bought this one um, through invertebrates. And this is a caterpillar, but invertebrates include all those little spiders, to et cetera, et cetera, all the little bugs that birds 
are going to get the protein and energy they need for their nestlings or during migration. This bird obviously migrating because it doesn't nest in Florida. Invertebrates are so critical. So how do we get invertebrates? By planting plants that actually get eaten. It kills me with so many times and some Facebook groups and some that I just have to finally quit where people go, I don't know what's wrong with my plant. It's being chewed up. And I think, God, you should be the happiest person on the planet. If your plant's being chewed up, that's what it's supposed to do. Plants are supposed to be eaten. If they're not being eaten and your leaves are perfect, then throw that plant out and get something that's being eaten up by bugs because those bugs are critical to the entire foundation of a living landscape. All of the invertebrates that might be chewing them up. We can also provide food indirectly, of course, probably not for caracaras, by, by attracting food for them. One of my bird watching friends from Pinellas who will go nameless, she and her ex-husband used to have this giant platform feeder that would suck in collar doves and every year they raised a brood of cooper's hawks in their neighborhood because the collar doves were so easy to catch on that bird feeder they were essentially not feeding collar doves but feeding cooper's hawks we could do that so the attributes of our plants, what they're going to provide is what we have to consider. It's not a difficult thing to consider, but of course they're not all created equal. And as I said, one thing is food size. This is a hog plum, Zymenia, not the prunus that's sometimes called hog plum. I hate that common name for that plant. And this has got a really large succulent fruit. It would take a really large bird to be able to swallow this and they have to swallow it whole, you know that. If it's smaller, more birds can eat it. I love hawthorns almost everything I've ever named in my life. Like my nursery is Hawthorne Hill. My last name means hill and I love hawthorns. And these are two of them. And it's a good example of comparing the value of two things. Because this summer haw is a relatively large crab apple. Maybe as big as my index finger digit. Certainly as big as my thumbnail. That's a fairly large fruit. Summer haw ripens in the summer, which is why it's called summer haw. And there's not a lot of birds eating fruit in the middle of summer, especially ones that eat a fairly large one. So most of the time, unless the squirrels eat them, they fall to the ground. And I love this plant and I've got one in my yard. I plant it on every place I've lived since I moved to Florida. It's a great plant, but it's not the best of the haws for wildlife. The one on the right, which is almost never sold, I had to grow mine from seed and I got two in my backyard. They didn't bloom this year. So I'm going to wait another year or two to hopefully be able to grow some for other people. It's called little hip haw because those hips or haws are really small. They're way smaller than your little finger fingernail, maybe about two thirds the size at most. They turn bright red and they hang on the tree through the winter unless somebody eats them. What an amazing attribute. I have hundreds and hundreds of tiny fruit that every fruit eating bird would be able to swallow. They're bright red, so they're obvious. You know, there is a reason why most things turn red when they're ripe and hide from things when they're green and don't want to be eaten yet. And I won't go into that any more than this. Lots of fruit, really small, carries it through the fall and winter as food gets to be in a shortage like the hoon hollies in this plant they all of a sudden become absolutely critical for wax wings and robins and all kinds of other fruit eating birds. And it's also true for oaks. That live oak acorn is tasty. You can make all kinds of great things out of it, but it's relatively large. Turkeys eat it, pigs eat it, squirrels eat it. Not a lot of birds. Blue jays probably eat them relatively often, but most things can't. But that Chapman oak has got a really small acorn. So do myrtle oaks. They have acorns small enough for a wider variety of birds. Oaks are good for caterpillars. Chapman oaks are really small. If I have a small space like I do now, that might be a good choice for me. But that live oak would be crazy because it would shade my entire backyard. And I would preclude my ability to grow so many other plants that need sunlight or an ample amount of sunlight when I have them in the neighborhood. If a bird wants to go to a live oak, it just flies over the property line and goes to my next door neighbor. Seasonality is an important factor. So when is the fruit ready? This is a yaupon holly. It's obviously a girl because hollies come as males and females. You have to have a male to get maximum fruit. 
You might get lucky and get a few fruit on a girl without a boyfriend, but you mostly want girls for all hollies. The Alpine hollies are just so good. What a great evergreen dense shrub to hide in during the winter. What great winter cover for things. I planted a thicket of these at the Pinellas extension of it's about 25 plus years ago. And in the winter time, there are so many birds hiding out in the thicket of this with a few other things I added to it to make a mixed thicket. But when these are ripe, they're small, they're succulent, and they're in the fall. Now, fall is that time where everything is ripe. That's why we have Thanksgiving, because there's such a plethora of food available. And we can fatten ourselves up heading into winter. We don't want everything to be ripe in the fall if we're going to feed birds and other wildlife with fruit, which all birds and most all wildlife do eat some. The cat birds are eating it now. The mocking birds are eating it now. All kinds of things in my yard are eating it now. But the beauty of Yelpon holly, like that little hip haw, is that it holds that fruit if nobody eats it until way into the winter. When I worked in Sarasota County at a, as a consultant for five years, there were about seven Dahoon hollies in the parking lot, of, and I had a window office I could see the parking lot. And they were all girls. There had to be a boy somewhere in the neighborhood, but they were all girls and they would be full of fruit. And every year, not a single one of those fruit would get eaten. And then all of a sudden, about now, a flock of cedar waxwings would show up and they would eat all the fruit out of one tree and the next day, all the fruit out of the second tree. And by the end of a week, they'd eat every Dahoon holly fruit and they moved on. I followed them once on my lunch break and they went about a block or two down the road, maybe a mile down the road where another grove of Dahoon holly was. And I had to believe that that flock had members that were there the year before and they knew where that fruit was and it was critical for their migration. Seasonality is important. We don't want everything to be ripe in the spring. We don't want everything to be ripe in the fall when most things are. We need things to carry through the winter that are going to be ripe until spring starts kicking in and more things are ready. Elderberry is one of those plants that's kind of weedy and suckers, and I've never planted one in all honesty, but it's a great wildlife plant. It's always got flowers and always got fruit. You know, you're attracting pollinators with the, with the flowers and you're attracting birds with the fruit and in the right place managed well and pruned a little bit, it can make a great hedge. Swamp dogwood doesn't need to grow in a swamp. You can plant it in a parking lot, median strip, and I've seen it done that way and still have it survive. It's not like flowering dogwood. But the beauty about swamp dogwood, like some plants, is you notice that the fruits ripen at different times. Some of those fruit are dark purple and some are already gone and some are really light green and some are darker green the ones that are least ripe. And so over the course of several weeks to a month, there's a few fruit every day that are ripe and the birds pick those off. They wait for the other ones, they pick them off the next day. And so a swamp dog with this full of clusters of fruit that are small and succulent can feed birds for probably a month or more before it runs out. As I said, winter food is so critical. These are some that uh, by themselves, my, this is a parsley haw in the picture, the other hawthorn. And this one is available sometimes. All these plants here produce tons of fruit that usually gets carried over. But beautyberry, what a great plant for wildlife. If you've got a beautyberry, you know that. You know that it can be pretty. There's a white fruited form. It's just an anomaly. It's a, essentially an albino. There's no great value to it, except it looks weird and different. And people always want weird and different. But the purple one is better for birds because it's pink. It attracts the attention of birds so much more than a white fruit does. But you know, if you've got this plant, you know a couple of things. First is one plant makes more fruit than all the birds in Florida can eat in a month. I mean, it's crazy to plant an entire hedge of this plant because it's good for wildlife because now you're tying up space with things that don't need it. Plant a beauty barrier to in different parts of your yard, put it in a mixed hedge, let it do its thing, and use the rest of the space for different species with different attributes. And the second thing is when beauty berry gets ripe, they all ripe at the same time, and then they fall to the ground and rot. So, you know, you've got a fairly short window. It's not like those haws or the hollies that'll hold the fruit until someone eats one, and then someone eats another one. These things are boom or bust. Dependability is an issue. 
You know, this oak tree, there are so many oaks in Florida that I love to death, like turkey oaks, that only produce a good acorn crop about every seven years. You know, if your landscape is designed with a lot of plants that don't produce annually in a reliable way, then you need, and you really want one. You really want a turkey oak, a blue jack oak. You know, even the live oaks in my old house didn't produce lots of acorns in a lot of years. You want to add other things in it that are dependable so that when these things are producing acorns, it's wonderful. And when they're not producing hardly any, something else is going to use them. And that's true, yeah, for firebush. What a great plant. Firebush is the ultimate hummingbird plant. You cannot do better than a firebush. I don't care what you plant. It is the best hummingbird plant. Those flowers get attract a lot of butterflies and bees. And when the fruit ripens, it is where all the mockingbird, catbird, etc., brown thrasher activity is in my backyard right now. And they're all gone. They ate them all. What a great plant. But firebush dies to the ground at 31 degrees. You know, if you planted this like I did for hummingbirds, and that's all I did, I'd be a fool. Because every number of years, including this year, it died back pretty bad. Even though we didn't get to 32, we got to about 35. It set it back. It didn't start flowering till just recently, just a few flowers. That's when you plant coral honeysuckle and red salvia and other things that are going to provide food for the hummingbirds when your firebush is recovering from a cold spell. And as I said, invertebrates are the foundation. This is Christina's picture again. What a great shot that is. You know, and this bird is picking little bugs out of this Coreopsis, which is, well, Florida is a strange state. We just decided the entire genus of Coreopsis was our state wildflower. So this is one of them. We have so many other invertebrates. You know, when I took this picture on this uh, wavy leaf meadow rue, I took it for the flowers. It wasn't until I got home and discovered it had this totally cool grasshoppery thing in it. Anyhow, I don't know about you, but I can walk. When I was a kid and I lived in, grew up in Wisconsin, I could walk through the neighborhood and I'd have to knock grasshoppers off my pants all the time. They were always jumping on me. It seemed kind of gross. If I was in a pasture, uh, open field there'd be millions of grasshoppers everywhere and if you picked them up they'd spit on you and i didn't appreciate them i give anything when i see a grasshopper now when i get one in my yard i'm just absolutely thrilled because i almost never see them i don't know what we've done to grasshoppers and developed landscapes but they just don't exist such an important food source not lovers everybody else these little crab spiders and all the other spiders in the world are Totally amazing creatures, but also are bird food. Invertebrates are this foundation. This is the picture Christina took that I used in my wildflower book. Absolutely critical for two things. First of all, so many things eat pollinators, not so much bees. We don't have bee eaters here, you know that. But the second thing they do is they pollinate stuff, which creates the seeds and fruit and all the things that I've been talking about up to now. All the little crab apples, everything else that we want to feed our birds with have to be pollinated. And almost no plant anymore uses wind. About 85 plus percent of all plants in the universe are pollinated by pollinators. Almost all plants are pollinated. They're flowering plants. And almost all of those are not subject to the vagaries of wind direction, except for grasses. They are pollinated by things. And we're not going to get fruit if we don't have pollinators. That's an agricultural issue, but it's also an issue for a living landscape. And there are so many of them. When Christina shared this picture with me, I wrote a paragraph in my book so I could use it because I love this picture. And I went outside and I thought, you know, it's a longhorn bee and they're not very big. This picture makes them look bigger than it is. And I said, you know, Christina lives a mile from my house. I need to start looking. And so I went outside and within about 20 to 30 minutes, I found longhorn bees in my yard. I just never knew they existed. And when I started looking for bees, I discovered that I had dozens and dozens of species of bees. When once upon a time, I thought I had honeybees, bumblebees, and bees. The diversity of native bees, especially not counting the non-native honeybees is astounding in Florida, but they all have different habitat requirements. And we can't just throw flowers out there for them. Of course, butterflies, this deltoid scarab beetle is a pollinating beetle. 
it's the one thing that pollinates pawpaws and and um, gopher apple and a variety of other stinky flower plants that require beetles. I'm never going to get this beetle in my yard living in an urban suburban desert like I do. I'm going to get butterflies because they can fly. I'm going to get bees because they can fly. I'm probably never going to get deltoid scarab beetles. If I do, I'll be just thrilled because they are pollinators. They're effective and so many beetles are. The surfid fly, we have all kinds of flies that are important pollinators. So we need to provide invertebrates, but we can do that not just with the leaves of trees and shrubs, but all the other things. I mulch with leaf litter. This is my old yard. My new yard looks like this everywhere. I have a wooded place. I don't do it in my wildflower areas, but I do it in the little woods areas that I'm creating in my backyard that's designed for birds. Mulches are the at one of the most misunderstood things in the world because you know soil is a living thing. It's not just quote dirt. It's full of microorganisms, bacteria that are critical for assimilating nitrogen because plants can't get nitrogen from the atmosphere any more than we can. They get it through um, certain kinds of soil bacteria. All these mycorrhizal fungi that are absolutely critical for plant roots to function properly. A, living, a soil is alive with those things. So many nematodes are important for plants and their growth. They're not devastating. There are bad nematodes. There's bad bacteria, there's bad fungi, don't get me wrong. But a living soil needs to be fed and we feed it through mulch. But if we use mulches as a top dressing because they're attractive and they don't decompose, we're completely violating that principle because we need mulches that do decompose, that feed the soil, that provide for things. And of course, earthworms aren't native to Florida, but a lot of things eat them. When they decompose, it's great. Every year, I get more leaves. You know, people throw them out. If somebody was really smart up in, in uh, New England, they'd bag all those sugar maple leaves and sell them in bundles down here to Yankees like me living in Florida, because I would buy them. It's the best mulch in the world. And they probably burn them or take them to landfills. Before my landscape was well developed, especially at my old house, uh, my ex wife and I would drive around with her RAV4 and pick up bundles of, of uh, leaves that people had raked and put in bags and set on the curb. And that's what I mulched all of our yard with for years until our trees got big enough to create their own mulch. And that's what I'm doing in my backyard. I have all deciduous trees for the most part because I need the sun in the winter and spring for my native azaleas and things to, to flower properly. And the leaves when they drop, feed my soil. It's a perfect storm. Invertebrate diversity is directly correlated with landscape diversity. And there are studies that show that, and I'm not gonna bore you with the details. I read this study once and I think it came from FSU, but I'll pick on them anyhow. Go gators. Anyhow, these horticulture people, you could just see them throwing up their hands in despair saying, if we're going to control bugs in our yard, we've got to just plant yards with three or four species of plants because if we start adding more things, we're going to get more insects. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you guys just made my point. Thank you. Because we're not whether it's native or not native, we are never going to get the invertebrate diversity we need for a foundation of a living landscape unless we have diversity. Not a hedge of one plant, but a mixed hedge of several mixed together. Not just the same trees that all my neighbors have, but something my neighbors don't. I planted a basswood in my yard to anchor my woods. It's the only tall shade tree that'll be in my backyard. I have a lot of understory trees. Nobody has a basswood in my yard. I love basswoods. They produce some of the world's greatest honey. Bees love them to death. And there isn't one. I didn't need some of the other things I could have planted. It made sense to me. But besides landscape diversity, like I said, is this absolute reduction in pe pesticides because it's just absolutely crazy. The vertebrate diversity is related to all of these things. You need to produce them throughout our landscape. Most of them are not in the canopy foliage. Caterpillars and butterflies and moths often are, but there's a crap load, excuse my French, of butterflies that lay eggs and produce caterpillars on grass.
grasses and wildflowers and weeds and all kinds of other things. A naturalistic understory, like I talked about with real mulches that decay are significant. We need to get away from this manicured thing. You know that, that longhorn bee overwinters in hollow stems. If we go through our wildflower gardens, whatever, and prune everything back so it looks nice in the winter when things are dead, we just cut away all their habitat. If we don't leave some bare soil for things like all those green helicted bees, oh my God, I love those metallic bees, and they all are ground nesting. So many bees are. And we cover over their potential nesting sites so they can raise young with a thick layer of mulch. We need open space. But so many times people think they're going to be looked at as a bad gardener if they have these bare dirt spots in their yard. But you know, birds dust in them too. It can be a really important thing. We need to get past this well manicured approach. It doesn't mean we create a jungle. Doesn't mean we don't do some pruning. But if you're going to prune back to dead stems, do it in the spring when things start greening up again, but not in the fall when that habitat is absolutely critical. Providing water is significant, and I'm not going to go into it very much. Water can be a really important feature, and I'm sure you know that. But the most important feature that was in my old yard that's in Christina's yard and in a place in Pasco that I've been doing some work with is to put in a slow-moving stream. My God, that's so much better than a bird bath. Bird baths can be effective, but we often misuse them. First of all, we often look at bird baths, and I'm sure none of you do, but so many people I talk to do as a lawn ornament. So we want to buy one that's really pretty. We want to buy one that's glazed really nice. It looks really gorgeous. Now, I don't know about you, but if I invite company to take a shower in my bathtub, which I know most people don't have bathtubs and showers anymore, if you don't have a bath mat in it, they're going to slip and die, right? So you put a bath mat in it. Why would you put a bird bath out there with this heavy glaze that's they're going to slip? Now, that doesn't mean they're going to drown, but it means when the hawk flies over and they got to push off the bottom and they slip, they're dead. Birds will not come to a bird bath if it's too close to cover. When I used to work for a county extension with the university, I would get notes and pictures from people all the time. Birds just don't use my bird bath. And I'd look at it, it was like, it was like that salt palmetto in the background, but it was eight feet closer and it was right on the water. I don't know if you ever watched Wild Kingdom. I did when I was a kid. And Marlon never did anything but sit in his Jeep next to a water hole with a camera and shoot pictures of things that came to water. Things come to water. If I'm a feral cat or some other predator, I'm going to watch a water feature. And if there is. You know, if there's cover close by, I'm going to hide in it, and that little bird's going to have no chance. But the second thing is, like with this, this is a summer hawk, I love the fact that they weep. It's leaning a bit more than they often do, but they often lean anyhow. You know, the summer hawk is, is green in the summer, and it's open in the winter. And if I'm a little bird, I'm going to land in that mess, that little thicket that's there, especially when there's leaves on it. I'm going to look around and see if it's safe. I'm going to dive down. If it's scary, I'm going to fly back up and disappear. That's what the birds do in my yard anyhow. Landscapes provide cover. We need to think about it, but I've been talking pretty much a long time, and I'm going to zip through this part of it like I often do. But plants are not just providing food. They're not just aesthetic. We need to understand cover, and cover changes. It depends on the attributes of the individual plant, but it also is a factor of our landscape plan. How do we put plants together to maximize it? Foliage density is really important. This wild olive, which is an osmanthus, is a pretty much a useless plant. I mean, I love it. It smells great. This isn't the fragrant wild olive that's not native. This is one of the native ones. But those branches are skinny and wimpy, and it's not hiding anything, and nobody eats that fruit. It's like having kapok from a life preserver in the middle of that thing. I can't imagine anything swallowing it. Wax myrtle on the other hand, damn, what a great plant. You can't see through this thing. If I'm hiding in a bunch of wax myrtle, I am lost. And if it's in a girl that's pollen been pollinated, I got fruit to boot. Branch structure is so important. I think if I was forced to name my favorite native plant, tree at least would be a fringe tree. I plant them everywhere I go. When it's in bloom, it's spectacular. But look at those branches. Nothing can build a nest in a fringe tree. I mean, geez, they're long and skinny and there's leaves at the very end and there's no foliage in between even when it's done flowering. But you look at an elm tree, 
you know, I grew up with American elms in, was in Madison and my neighborhood. And in the winter when the leaves would be off the elm trees, every tree had oriole nests in them besides other kinds of things. And if you look at the structure, you can see the forks. They're all different sizes. And they're all pointing up. And so if I'm a big to a little tiny bird, I can find a fork of the right size that's upright that I can position a nest in that's going to be secure. Elms are really important nesting plants and fringe trees aren't. Evergreen and deciduous is an important issue. You know, a deciduous tree, one that loses its leaves during the late fall to winter until spring is such a great plant because it gives light to the understory. If you have understory plants that need sunlight and most of mine do. In the summer, that Florida sugar maple has got as good a cover as anything does, but there's nothing there in the winter. So where are birds gonna hide if there's still, you know, cardinals, et cetera, and migratory birds that are here in the winter, like the palm that are in my yard, half of them are probably gonna leave. They're gonna go to find things that are evergreen that I can hide in, and that's a southern red cedar or a bunch of other things. If that red cedar is a girl that has, those aren't fruit, of course, they're little cones, but birds plant them in my yard all over. They come up in my pots in my little nursery constantly. Thorniness is underrated, but it, you know, my mom used to read me this story about the rabbit running into the briar patch. Maybe yours did too. Having briars can be really valuable. You just don't put them in a place where you're walking. If you got kids like I did, you don't play baseball and football in a yard full of sweet acacia. But if you put them in the back corners where nobody really goes, having thorns can be really valuable. And that's sweet acacia and bumelias, which are now Cideroxalon is a genus name. Some of the best wildlife plants around almost never sold for some reason. And context is important. These are Yalpon hollies and Chickasaw plums growing together naturally in a place I was at once upon a time, 35 millimeter slides, the color's a little crappy, but what a great dense bird thicket that is. This rouge plant by itself is useful, but planted in a, the right understory in mass is just unbelievable cover for things like oven birds and other birds that are poking around on the ground. The flowers are great for pollinators. The red fruit are great for lots of fruit eating birds. And that cover it gives above the soil surface is really valuable for the water thrushes and the oven birds and the hermit thrushes and all the other things that might be there. So I want to end, you know, you probably wonder if this guy can ever shut up. I actually promise I will. But the context of our landscapes are so important because when I talk about this, a lot of people think that creating a landscape for wildlife is something that's going to uh, bring on the ire of their homeowner association and their neighbors, and they're going to be embarrassed and they can't do it. But there are so many different models to choose from. It's not like you have to plant a deep woods. In fact, a lot of times that might be the last thing you want to do, depending on what you're trying to attract. You know, if you want pollinators, you want an open prairie. This is Kissimmee Prairie. There is so much diversity here. And none of those grasses, for the most part, are as high as my knee. I could probably mow it twice a year if I really wanted to. If no one was looking, I'd set it on fire, but I'd probably get in trouble for that. This is a model for a yard, just like that Apalachicola picture was. This is part of Christina Evans's yard that she's kind of trying to use that model. And she's got it formalized because she's got some grass on the outside that she mows and she's got some hedges. And so it doesn't look wild and crazy, but the part that's kind of wild and crazy actually would probably not draw the ire of anybody. I think it's my wallet book. It says this is my backyard. And I've had people write me and say, damn, I would love to come to your house. The sad thing is this is at a state park in the panhandle and they mislabeled the caption, but this is a scrub. There is open and sunny, a sand pine, lots of lichen, some rosemary, but you can do that. And that open, and this is part of my old front yard where I had really, really bad dirt. Alexis, ex-husband before me was really cheap and used a bunch of really cheap fill. You couldn't hardly grow anything in this. It was god awful. I moved the mailbox and I put plants that grow in beaches and things here and it, they did really well. And that open sand was used by all kinds of ground nesting bees. You can see this little indentation um, in the middle of that picture, I think. A couple of white spots that are probably holes where green metallic bees had nesting holes. Um, 
birds would dust bathe in it. And people thought it was attractive when they came by. You live in a beach. This is a beach. This is a beach uh, railroad vine. There's all kinds of great beach plants that we can use instead of trying to get by with grass and non natives. This is, you know, I first came to Florida, some people in Audubon, but now your chapter told me that there just wasn't any life in a flatwoods. It was like a wildlife desert. It's like you've never been to a real flatwoods because a real flatwoods like this, which is a Gothi state forest, um, those palmettos are not higher than your knee. And they're full of wildflowers and native grasses and other things. And that's full of wildlife. And those trees are widely spaced. And we can mimic that kind of thing where we have widely spaced trees with a lot of sunlight in the understory and something at the bottom. Probably not turf grass, but lots of other things. And in a way, this kind of models it from my old yard. We're not going to be able to put a spring in like we got at Juniper Springs. That's too bad. But water features are really important. And if we have deciduous forests, if our woods, the trees we plant, like I've done in my backyard and most of my backyard in the corners are all deciduous, then when that sunlight comes through in the spring, that's the wildflower. These are Spigelia um, marilandica, which is called Indian pink, and there's acres of it here. And it's only here because it gets sun in the winter and early spring and it gets shaded over in the rest of the year. And that's where so many things need it, that we have problems growing. So many people talk to me about problems growing this plant. It's almost always not giving it enough sun. We protect plants from sun and plants eat sun. That is what they eat. So what you do and what we do and what we encourage people around us to do is completely in our hands. We've got to start at home. We've got to set our own goals. They've got to be realistic. And we design it for wildlife that we want to attract. And that includes everything. I'm not going to get a box troll in my yard here. Yeah, I guess it's remotely possible. I know it's not. But, you know, I got a pig frog in my old yard. And I don't know where that one came from. But it was there for over a year. Lizards, not just human and all. You know, there's no mystery to creating Luna moths. If you live too far south, you're not going to get them. But I see them in Pasco County. I saw them at Brooker Creek. They eat a couple of kinds of trees, especially hickory and sweet gum in this part of the world. If you don't have those trees in your neighborhood, you're not going to get Luna moths. But Jesus, when I get so excited when I see a Luna moth. They only live for about a week at most. But when they're there, they're just breathtaking. I do everything I can to try to get one. Hummingbirds and migratory songbirds like this American Red Start and even big wildlife like badgers, they're all in our hands. So thank you for listening and I thank these folks for some of the slides. And if you have questions, I am happy to try to take them. Thank you. I survived my first Zoom meeting. <laughs> and it was great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. We, we do have a couple questions that came in in the uh, chat box. And if anybody else has a question, um, you want to put it in the chat box, I'll pass it on. Um, one of them was, does anything eat milkweed bugs? They seem to be more abundant in the last five to 10 years. Milkweed bugs are a problem and I've never seen anything eat them. You know, they feed on milkweed, which probably makes them taste terrible and they give off a really awful scent. And they can be very damaging to milkweeds, I'll be honest. It's one of the few bugs that when I see them in my yard, I squish them. Okay. I don't I do spray this, them with pesticides, but I do squish hoppers. them. Um, another question that came in, um, what about the wasp that eats monarch caterpillars? Is that a native or a non-native? Uh, seem to be more of those in the last years. Um, well, you know, there are pollinating wasps and there are predatory wasps, and I'm not aware of any non-native predatory wasp that's abundant or that's a problem. So I suspect those are native wasps and they're doing what wasps are supposed to do. And we don't like it, don't get me wrong. When they pick off my caterpillars and they do from time to time, I'm sad, but it's the balance of nature. And I firmly believe that our end goal should be to create what I call a living landscape that's in balance and that we 
encourage the life that lives with us and try to enhance it that we're not so much trying to put our personal preferences to stop certain things and help other things i think when we start playing god like that we've lost sight of what the really what the real goal of of connecting to natural areas is if our goal is to provide the stepping stones of our yards to natural areas so that there's corridors for things to move through then We've got to accept the life that lives with us, my opinion. All right. Everyone um, else is too scared, right? I I have um, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned about the bees, and I know I have seen these little bee boxes where people yeah. either drill holes in a piece of wood or put pieces of uh, bamboo of varying dimensions varying diameters yes uh together but recently i read something about um that they are actually that those bee box things are not good because by congregating the bees they are spreading um disease where yeah, i've read that too uh, mary there's a lot of controversy about bee boxes. A lot of people that want to do things for those kinds of bees, carpenter bees. Um, and they're very cool. And I made one myself a number of years ago um, that nobody ever used, but so maybe it was good. Um, but most of the literature coming out now is, is really trying to steer people away from using them. And, you know, if we leave dead wood and things out there, I mean, I have a tree behind me that's dead. It's got a bunch of stems, the woodpeckers drill in it. I've got some of those carpenter bees flying around the last week and I suspect they may be finding holes and cavities in there uh, to be able to raise some young instead of concentrating them, like you said. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, I, I happen to have a pair of screech owls in a oh, God. in my front yard and I am so happy. And I got a screech out box that's been sitting vacant forever, and I know how you'd feel. Well, mine used it. I have a screech owl box. They sat in it for a couple of nights, moved out, but now I've seen them in the old woodpecker hole out front. Ah. Um, another question came in. Are there native bromeliads that are helpful to wildlife? Well, there's a bunch of native bromeliads. Some of them are extremely rare and only occur in extreme South Florida. We don't want to mess with those, um, although they're very cool. You know, we have a, you know, ball moths and Spanish moths are native bromeliads. Um, the issue with, and I have a number of native bromeliads in my yard just because I like them, but they're not especially valuable. When they flower, there are things that would nectar from them, but I would challenge anybody to tell me a flower that nothing has ever nectared from. Now I read on these Facebook pages, oh my God, I'm leaving this thing, it's a weed, but I saw a bug nectaring on it. It's like, yeah, what flower doesn't some bug nectar on? The issue is providing things that provide nectar for a wide variety of things as opposed to once in a great while. So bromeliads by themselves, I wouldn't plant any for wildlife value, to be honest. Um, if you're planting the native ones, which I'm not sure most of them are ever sold commercially, you can stick them up in your tree. Um, they're just cool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but if you're, it'd be one of the last plants I searched out to add to my landscape, if, uh, unless I saw some blown down somewhere and wanted to rescue them. Yeah. Um, those uh, little prothonotary, uh, not prothonotaries, uh, the Perula warbler that you had a, yes. a picture of in there, they nest in bundles of hanging Spanish moss. Absolutely. So. But, but usually really high in like cypress trees. And I, you know, I'm not gonna ever live long enough for my basswood to get that tall. And if I had a cypress tree and I have, I would be long dead before it got tall enough for a perula warbler. But, you know, they are, it is really valuable cover. That is true in certain situations for things to hide in. And of course, but, don't but, ever uh, use cypress mulch in your yard, please. I hope nobody in this group does. 
<laughs> what an incredible waste of a beautiful tree. Yes. Well, two years ago, the uh, there was a Perula warbler nest um, less than 10 feet above the boardwalk at Lettuce Lake. Oh, really? And and Very we could cool. stand there on the boardwalk and watch the the parents go in and out feeding the wow. young. In there. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, uh, I went back to Lettuce Lake for the first time in about a decade, about a month ago. Ah. I've forgotten how nice it was. So what a great park. Yes, it, it is. Um, there's a, a question here in the chat box, and then I have another question in the chat okay. box. Is pine needle mulch okay? Well, pine needle mulch, it depends on what your goals are. I mean, I have used it in wildflower beds and I use it really sparingly so it's not deep um, because if you have wildflowers and native grass and you're trying to create this so-called wildflower meadow most of your plants need to reseed and they can't tolerate mulch any depth whatsoever but pine needles because there's a lot of open space seeds can fall between it and it doesn't impede things as much as a lot of mulches do you still want to use it too thick pine needles decay rather quickly which some people don't like because you got to keep adding them but i like mulches that decay obviously so i think that's a good thing i've used pine needle mulch they're really slippery you don't want to put them in a walkway or a place you're walking around in and i use fallen leaves oak and maple not so much live oaks because they're so darn thick they don't decompose as quick as a laurel oak does or a turkey oak I use those kind of leaves in my wooded parts of my landscape and I use, if I use mulch at all in wildflower areas, I'll use pine straw. Okay. I, I have a lot of cherry laurels, so I just rake all of those leaves into the- Good move. Into, into the flowers. Um, a nice thin leaf. You, you talked about beauty berries and I'm wondering because I have various beauty berries through my yard, the ones that have happened to be right outside my kitchen window, which is right on the other side of my my laptop here. Uh, yes, they were empty. The catbirds, the the uh, thrushes emptied them. But yeah. I have one beauty berry that's on the east side of the house. So oh. it's on the east side of the house, and there's only like a the five foot section between the edge of the house and the the fence. And it still has berries in it. Any wow. idea why they would not go there? It's always a really good question, Mary. Um, but you know, not all plants are created equal. It just may be that that beauty berry genetically is inferior taste-wise. I don't know. Um, I used to think wild petunia, Ruelia, was about the best pollinator plant in the planet. I did some research on it in a butterfly garden. It was the number one plant. I planted some in my house about a mile and a half away and no one ever used it. So why is beyond me. I have a lot of it in my yard here. It comes up everywhere. Almost nothing ever nectars on it. It was the best nectar source. The same butterflies when I was at the county extension office and I did a wildflower meadow there. Um, so I suspect it's the plant it could be the context, depending on what's around it. Maybe they're more comfortable in that cluster of beauty berries you mentioned feeding on it than they are in that one that's by itself. I don't know that either. Those are always good questions. Um, okay. Um, two other questions here came in. Where do you get your plants? And ah. is wild, cough, wild coffee useful, useful for anything? Well, coffee is a great plant. Where do I get my plants? I get them from everywhere. You know, I, I don't understand people that think it's too much trouble to drive X miles to get a plant. Because I've gone to the Keys and I've gone to the far panhandle and I've gone everywhere else. If somebody has a plant, no one else does that I really want because I do want it. And that's the only place I can get it. I get, you know, the nurseries that are affiliated with FAN, that's the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, are the professionals trying to eke out a living selling native plants. Um, 
And so I support them as much as I can. And because I live where I do, I think the two best ones is Green Isles and Groveland and uh, Tom Heisman's Nursery Sweet Bay right over the Skyway Bridge in Parrish. Bruce Turley has a very good retail nursery in Largo. Um, and I try to support those people because they're working hard to support the business and the, all the goals and objectives I've got with native plants. So, but what, I have gone all over kingdom come. I grow some, when, you know, I started my own little wildflower nursery because to be honest, there are very few wildflowers being propagated in Florida. There's just wasn't a market for them and I wanted things. And so I would find a few seeds here and there when I was hiking in the woods and I'd grow them and then, if they did well, I'd collect seeds for my plants and I got a nursery license. So I grow a lot of wildflowers from seed. I collect in my own plants and sometimes friends, and you know, I have a lot of friends around the state and I ask people in North Florida, if they see this, I'd love some seed and they send it to me because they're good people. So all over the place, to be honest with you. But I, I think people, you know, if your plant's gonna live 20 to 50 to 100 years, then spend a few bucks, have a fun road trip day, buy dinner and go to a nursery and get something. And if you go, if no one else has it closer by and that fan has a website and you can type in the plant you're looking for, it will tell you who's growing it, if anybody is and where they're located and you can make plans. And sometimes, you know, I'm gonna be in North Florida, South Florida, East Coast, wherever I am, and there's a nursery there I haven't been to in forever, and I'll plan to stop because I'm in the area. It's not like I get in my car sometimes, although I have and drive five miles to get, or five hours to get someplace to buy two plants and drive home again. But most of us are out and about here and there, and friends, native plant chapters have plant sales. Um, so many ways to do it. What was the name of the one that you said in Largo? It's called Wilcox. Wilcox, okay. We're on Indian Rocks Road, which is um, almost to the Gulf of Mexico, right off of uh, Bay. Yeah, okay. Walsingham, it's Walsingham at that point. I'm sorry, it's, it's um, it turns into Walsingham. And that's, where, you know, that's a really good retail nursery, really good people. The wild coffee, I didn't really answer. Wild co There's three species of wild coffee native to Florida. They're all really good. I prefer the one that's called wild coffee, which is Psychotria nervosa. They are related to coffees, but you don't make coffee beverages from the dried fruit like you would with a true coffee bean. The flowers are extremely useful to a lot of pollinators, but well, coffee is best in semi-shade, and so in that situation, it draws zebra longwing butterflies as well as any flower I've ever seen. And the fruit, when they get ripe, get eaten by every fruit-eating bird in the universe, and they will poop it everywhere. If you have a, you know, a half-acre lot, you'll have wild <coughs> coffee everywhere in your yard after a number of years, which to me is great. There's a dwarf form and a tall form. The tall form is a little cold sensitive. The dwarf form isn't grows all the way up through Brooksville. Um, and I plant it everywhere I go. I put nine of them in my yard when I moved here uh, to my new house in Holiday uh, about three years ago. Always have wild coffee. Great plant in the understory. I showed that rouge plant picture, but the best wildlife plant for shadier areas is wild coffee. Okay. Um Yes, yeah, so you mentioned Green Isles in Groveland, Wilcox in Largo. Um, somebody else mentioned in the chat room, Sweet Bay Nursery down in yes. Parish. Sweet Bay is uh, great. Yes, I go there. And I have recently noticed if anybody lives in the South Tampa area on Henderson, just be uh, south end of Henderson, just before it turns into becoming Manhattan, there's a place there that has signs out native plant nursery. I haven't had a chance to stop, but I have driven past it a couple times. Um, so it is if a you're growing in industry. There's a guy with a small native plant nursery near me here 
uh, in Land O'Lakes, Pasco County. You know, the, the fan site is really good, and I like to support the people that are professionals that are willing to join that professional organization and help grow the industry. But there are a lot of people, I'm not a fan member, and I have a little wildflower nursery, so I'm hypocritical about what I just said. There's a bunch of little folks out there trying to make a difference, and, but I do like to support the people doing it as a business. Right. They're trying to feed their family and send their kids to college, and I can, I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah. So if if anyone wants to look for the fan website, you can. The other thing to do is call your cooperative extension office. I know that Hillsborough County Cooperative Extension seven four four five five one nine is the phone number. Um, and ask uh, ask for one of the master gardener offices, uh, but they they used to have a catalog, and they would be able to give you tell you who else in the area is a member, you know, um, whatever else you're looking for. So use your extension office that way too. Yeah, some uh, extension offices are better than others, but Hillsborough has a good one. Yeah. Um, and then another question came in here in the chat. What habitat does strawberry bush slash hearts of Boston like? Uh, strawberry bush is one of those understory mesocanic plants from the northern third of the state. Now, I grow a lot of plants like that in my yard. So I, I call people zonists sometimes for fun that go, oh my God, I'm in zone nine. I can't plant something because it's from zone eight. And, oh, help me, that's vegetable gardening. It's not native plant gardening. But to get a strawberry uh, plant, Hearts of Boston, to do well, you really need to give it, put it in a deciduous woodland so that it gets lots of sun in the winter and spring until right now my trees are leafing out and it's starting to shade them over again. They should be in a reasonably moist, fertile soil. It doesn't mean, you know, you're going crazy, but my dirt is not bad dirt for Florida dirt and I mulch with a lot of leaf litter and it decays and enriches the soil. It's the kind of soil they would do well in. It doesn't get too dry. The leaf mulch keeps it moister than if it was bare. But you don't want to cover it over with a bunch of wood chips and and um, pine bark and that kind of thing. Um, if you do that, um, it will probably do really well. It's not an especially long-lived plant. It's really interesting. And um, I've seen people grow it and have it do really well in this latitude. All right. Um, no more questions in the chat oh box. God. Anybody All else right. have a have a question? Mary. Yes. The nursery you're talking about on Henderson is called Little Red Wagon. That's right. What I thought it's, you were talking it's about. several yeah, people put it in the new. chat box here. So she just yeah. started up, and she mostly specializes in butterfly plants. That's her little niche, and I think she does a good job from what I've heard. Well, one of these times when I'm down that way, I'll have to be, make myself time to stop in. I'm usually off on some project or another. So. I know what you mean. She's invited me to swing by, but I haven't been in that area since she invited me, but I'll get there someday and see what she's doing. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't need well, any more plants, though. <laughs> Pardon? I don't need more plants. I got too many. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> But I still I'm, buy them. I, I'm in the process of trying to get rid of a lot of the non-natives that were either here when I moved in or that I put in in my early to Florida ignorance 27, 30 years ago. So I understand. So I'm, many I'm people making, are. Making, making more space now. Well, the thank beauty you. of my yard was it had almost nothing in it, but I'm renting, so I can't get rid of the things I hate because... <laughs> I don't own the land. Landlords have been patient with me ripping grass out and planting things so far. But yeah, I had to leave the uh, camphor tree and the fittest farm hedge and the logustrum hedge up by the front, all the things I pick on in my slide program. But 
if I ripped them out, I'd probably be looking for a new place to live. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Great, great I enjoyed program. it. Thank you thank guys you. for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was very good. If anybody has questions, you can find me out there. I'm pretty public. So, again, thank you. Yep. And if you don't have his book, go get it from Lucy. Buy, if you're gonna buy my book, buy it from Lucy. Yes. When you sign it, she's a wonderful person. Yep. All right. All right. You guys thank take you. care. I'm gonna sign out if I can figure out how to do it. Down, down <laughs> Down at the bottom, there should be a leave red leaf button, and 